Hello, everyone. Let me start by asking you a question. What do you think is the world's biggest problem? While you collect your thoughts, let me guide you with the answer by asking you another question. What is the commodity that we consume the most every day? It is crude oil, a form of energy. Let's park that aside and let me tell you how my journey started. Until four years ago, I used to view the world as you see it on the slide. Continents physically positioned against each other, with countries populated with people, and some water in between. Four years ago, I was invited to go to Africa to give a talk about what I thought back then was so exciting about my PhD work. I went to Africa, gave my talk, and the day before coming back, I went on a trip to Soweto, to a camp where people live in slums. That trip transformed my vision of the world, because I've seen people living without any form of connection, and I didn't know that existed. I went to the tour guide to do a reality check and asked him, is that for real? These people don't have switches? And he said, no, 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 it's far beyond that. They don't have access to electricity, and that's fine. But what's worse, that you can find hospitals here in Africa that runs out of power for more than 12 hours a day, every day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine hospitals running without power for 12 hours a day? I was really shocked and wanted to know more about how many people exactly live like that. So I went on Google and typed, how many people in the world don't have access to energy? And the answer came like a slap on my face. 1.2 billion people. 1.2 billion people out of the almost 7 billion people we have today in the world don't have access to electricity. It's around fifth of the world's population. It's like having five kids standing in front of an ice cream stand, four of them getting ice cream, and the fifth kid watching. I don't want to be this fifth kid. And you don't want to be this fifth kid, too. Actually, no one should be that fifth kid. But that trip made me think about the world and see it from the fifth kid perspective. The world map with uh, the energy poverty that we have in the world, and it's a lot. While this is a big problem, there is another dimension coming to this problem. The population of this world is projected to grow up to 11 billion people by the end of this century. And war refugees, like a seal in the picture, who is a Syrian refugee, add a new dimension to the problem. A seal was born to a world in a shape of a camp that doesn't have access to any form of electricity for studying, for lighting, for cooking, for medical treatment. And that is shocking, because how people like that are supposed to be developing and growing? What is the world? going to look like if we did not solve this problem. Isn't this the world's biggest problem? While a seal and the average African don't have access to a regular electricity, why should we, the people who do have access to electricity, why should we care? We should care because, first, this is a human, a basic human right, and equality does matter. But it's an issue beyond that. 
underprivileged communities and refugees in the developing world, they consume emergency power. They consume polluting and emitting fuels that comes to them like diesel and kerosene. And that creates a lot of pollutants. That makes the air toxic. And that is a problem because it exposes them to health problems. It exposes them to uh, health hazards that could really threaten their livelihood. And beyond that, the developing world has pressure to, keep, to catch up with the development and the economic growth that we at the developed world have. And in order to catch up, governments invest in dirty and polluting fuels. That means that there is a loop. In order to expand, you have to pollute more. And this loop is really difficult to escape. Furthermore, countries like India and China, small little countries, are now de developing and expanding fast, meaning that they are creating toxic air. That toxic air travels with climate events and prevailing winds, travels miles. So California and even Alaska are showing effects of pollutants that have been generating in China. So this is a problem of a global concern, and that's why we should care. Moreover, every year we lose around 5.5 million people from the world as a result of air pollution. 5.5 million people, that's the population of a country like Finland. So what's happening now that every year we are losing population of a country like Finland from the world map? Moreover, climate change, which I'm sure you all heard about climate change. Climate change hits everyone and affects everyone, but it hits vulnerable communities in the developing world the hardest. Climate change is like living in a flat with seven billion people and making sure that each one, each flatmate keeps the room clean. That is challenging, that is difficult. And that's why it necessitated an agreement, the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement came to contain and limit climate change and its impacts. And the conclusion was, under two degrees by 2050 is where we need to be in order to limit the ravages of climate change, in order to contain the extreme weathers like droughts and uh, and wildfires that are happening in the world, threatening the food supply and separating families, creating more conflicts and refugees. That's what, we, that's what we need to do. We need to limit the global warming, and that has to do with the energy that we consume. We focus too much on climate change, that we forget energy poverty and what that brings. Although, Energy security, air pollution, poverty in general, and climate change, these are all interlinked problems. And you know where they get linked? They get linked at the scale, the scale of more than one billion people. If we shrink the energy poverty uh, ring, we will impact all of these problems and eventually solve them. So if we look at what has been happening so far, the mechanism, of growth, if a country wanted to grow economically in the developing world, they would increase their consumption of fuels, which is coming from emergency fuels and dirty fuels, and that drove the overall health of the community involved down. This is not a sustainable equation. What we need to do is this. If we look at the energy consumption as a constant by linking it to only consuming clean energy, we want to increase the economic growth. We can increase that by increasing the constant of access to energy tied to clean energy 
and that will drive the overall health of the population up and not down. How we could achieve that? Although what I've been talking about during this talk is pretty intense, and it's difficult facts, but the message of this talk is really what can we do? What can be done? And a lot can be done. Talking about crossing borders, I feel very motivated by where this word could go and how it can change. If we use clean technologies that today are developed, and we in the developed world have mastered the economy of scale, we reduced the cost of clean technologies. We know how to harness power from the sun, from the wind, from the hydro power, and from clean biomass. If we take the power generated, link that to relevant storage means, like storage in batteries, or storage as hydrogen, if we combine them and customize them to communities, communities in the developed world won't need to go through a building infrastructure that as of today is very difficult and is limited. They could leapfrog to off-grid, to having 24 hours 7 access to power without having to go through the grid. That can be achieved at affordable prices. That can be achieved at a zero emission cost to the environment, to the population involved, and indeed achieve growth and improve life quality for these communities involved. If we provide universal access to modern energy to communities like that by 2030, that is going to cost us only 0.06% of global average GDP by that period. What else is a more worthwhile investment? Going back to the hospital example, I'm going to give you an example now of how we can run a hospital in Africa that as of today runs at half capacity, 12 hours a day, without needing to produce any pollutants. If we take the power generated when the sun is up or there is wind blowing, use water, split that water into hydrogen, and store the energy that we formed when the sun was up and when there was wind as hydrogen. When the demand at the hospital peaks, we release that hydrogen as energy. We can form a loop, a closed loop, where we don't produce any carbon emission. Why? Because hydrogen, for example, is the smallest molecule in the wood. It does not have any carbon in the first place. So when you burn it, it's not going to produce any carbon emissions. A, solutions like, a solution like this could be made affordable and could power many hospitals around the world. So this is an example of how the smallest molecule in the world could help solving the biggest problem of the world. As an engineer, a scientist, an economist, a volunteer, or even a voter, what would you do to help the world look as it should look like? All continents, fully powered, with some water in between. Thank you. <laughs>